It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 268 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 18th of June 2017. I'm Ed Brown and this week I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Joe Benamu. Hi Ed. Well we begin in a cave about 100 kilometres west of Marrakesh, the fourth largest city in Morocco. It's an archaeological site called Jabil Erhoud. And it's been known since the 1960s to have specimens of early Homo sapiens, early humans. And a recent study by an international team of scientists has dated some of these bones to over 300,000 years old. And if that's correct, it'd make them the oldest fossilised remains of modern humans ever found. And Penny, it'd also upset our entire understanding of the spread of humans out of Africa, wouldn't it? Yes and no, and that's what I find really, really interesting about this story is because, um, like, I'm interested in human evolution. I wouldn't say I'm any kind of expert on it, but it's just such a complicated thing. And one of the articles I read when I was researching this made the point that essentially, according to what geneticists think, pretty much all humanoids or humans of the last 2 million years or so could probably interbreed. So when we're talking about mm-hmm. different species of human that time, it's not the kind of high school definition of species that we're talking about. And so the question of how you define when's our earliest Homo sapiens ancestor versus some other kind of transitional human and where did they live and what's going on becomes definitional in a way rather than entirely. Yeah. yeah. It, it's that God of the gaps thing, like, you know, what, what was before modern humans and Homo heidelbergensis and what was between that and the one before it sort of thing is yeah. it's not a all of a sudden you have a Homo sapien and before that you didn't. It's a scale yeah, exactly. of more and more of- Homo sapien like features, I guess. But what's really interesting is even the kind of the branching trees that we think of as a bit better than, you know, that. Mm hmm. You know that stereotypical march of progress and the little crunched (laughs) down ape gradually stands up tall with a spear in his manly arm? And, you know, nowadays we look at a more branching tree. But one of the things that I think is interesting is it might almost be a braided tree in that groups might branch off and then rejoin the main tree and come back again. So it's even more complicated than what we might think. So what this fossil is and how it makes things complicated, it's... um, human or, you know, remains from our genus in a cave in Morocco called uh, Jebel Erhoud, I think. Yep. And they've been dated about 300,000 years old based on two different methods. So one called um, thermoluminescence dating, which works on it's able to measure how much time or how much radiation has been absorbed since an object was last heated. So that was done by dating um, stone tools that have been created dropped on, you know, discarded on the floor of a cave and then a fire was lit. And that was um, compared with electron spin resonance dating on tooth enamel, which both of these dating figures came together to give about 300,000 years. So the date is not in question. And there's no genetic material that has survived, no DNA. So the analysis has been done based on skull shape. And what these people probably looked like was a very modern human face. So the point is, if you looked at them front on, you probably would think, yep, that is definitely within the bounds of people who I it would expect to see as human today. You wouldn't bat an eyelid. If you looked at them from side on, you'd think something is not right. Because uncanny rather than, valley. Yeah, uncanny valley. Our kind of um, rounded brain, brain case, they have a more elongated brain case. So... I think no one would be surprised to say, you know, there was obviously going to be intermediate forms between archaic humans and modern humans. What I think is interesting is that this comes from this idea that did Homo sapiens kind of evolve in East Africa, just completely in the little area, the cradle of humanity and kind of burst out onto the world? Or did this process happen over a broader area? And I think 
from this um, study, it seems like it did happen over broader area. So the, these fossils show that there were very modern human-like people living in northern Africa, so above the Sahara, a very, very long time ago. So I thought this was really interesting. And I guess in some ways it's um, – I'm trying to – I want to express what I'm saying clearly – like it's not just definitional because whether you're a lumper and you kind of go, oh, everything that's kind of a bit human is homo, homo sapiens or a splitter and you want to have 500 different kinds of, you know, subspecies and variants, it's still another piece of the puzzle of how humans got here. And I think to me I found it fascinating because it does show us how complex the whole history of human evolution is. Even when you think you've got a grasp on some of that complexity, you can't just narrow it down to a really nice, clean story. And you've got to imagine also, and, and it ties in a little bit to one of the other stories we're going to be talking about um, mm. later, just the fact that the story may never be complete. We may never know yeah. everything, you know, that in terms yeah. of the fossil record, there, you know, those gaps may never be filled. And so the story that we tell, and particularly when I, when I think back to, you know, what I learned when I was in, uh, you know, in primary school and in high school and, and then, you know, uh, sort of doing biology later on, that story has just changed, you mm. know, in, in quite significant ways over, you know, over my lifetime. Um, and, and so what, you know, what future generations know is obviously going to be even, you know, even more fascinating and, and, and different and complex, but may never be mm. complete. And that, of course, is the beauty of science is that self-correcting, self-developing concept where we're mm. constantly finding more information, more evidence, building a different picture. And what we thought 10 years ago was the the leading theory is now no longer the case necessarily and mm. we're changing our mind according to the evidence. I wonder how and much of you- that, and, and, and Penny, you'd obviously be able to answer this question, but I wonder how much of that is conveyed to kids when they're actually, you know, when they're taught science about the fact that this is what we know now but it's not what we've always known and it will change. Because I, I, I remember being taught things that were, you know, which had a degree of certainty about them and, of course, they don't. It's really hard because I don't think evolution, being the most important theory in biology basically, mm. gets enough airplay in the curriculum as it probably should. And one of those reasons is it's not really introduced until quite late because it's seen as being quite abstract, which, you know, it is. So I think the level that it's often covered to in school is in a way, yeah, it is presented as this thing that we know because yeah. there's just no time to even – get any further even in the VCE or the the senior secondary biology I mean it's I do yeah. find it, I find it quite fascinating yeah. though how kids are able to actually grasp certain scientific concepts and I've never forgotten one of my uh, one of my nephews um, showing me a you know a whole lot of different animals um, classed into different categories like um, mm. you know uh, warm blooded and cold blooded and so on and I remember <laughs> looking at some of them I mean this, this was this was must have been you know a four and a half year old or a five year old and um, some of them mm. were of dinosaurs and and he looked up at me and he said yes those are the deadiest ones <laughs> <laughs> well I mean my little girl just turned two and I actually got her a book based on a friend's recommendation like basically evolution for preschoolers and it's really cute I might do a little plug it's called um grandmother fish by Jonathan Tweet I think let me just yes Jonathan Tweet so and it's just really cute it's like this is our great 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 you know our grandmother fish she could wiggle and breathe can you and it just goes through and here's cousin you know cousin dinosaur and whatever I thought yeah like it doesn't have to be seen as this really difficult abstract thing that we can't Mm. possibly teach until university but I guess there's a lot of residual fear that somehow if you're teaching evolution it goes against people's religious beliefs when I really don't feel that that's you know, I wonder if some of this idea is, oh, it's... My yeah, takeaway from this hard. story, so, yeah. sorry, we keep talking over each other. No, no, yeah, we should go back to the st- actual story. <laughs> but, but no, my takeaway from this story about the 300,000-year-old fossils is that, like, how can you then be a creationist? How can you then say the world is 6,000 years old? It's such a mental backflip and convolution to then justify and make allowances for all these sorts of things. I mean, this is multiple lines of evidence pointing to humans being here more than 100,000 years old. 
mm. uh, user of time. So I, I don't get that- how you can be a young earth creationist and still look to evidence, but obviously it's just it's mental acrobatics. But in a way, aren't those young earth creationists like the really strong anti-vaxxers? Like they, it's for, for whatever reason they hold their belief and yeah. the evidence doesn't matter. But there's, I'm sure, a lot of people who have a really deep faith in whatever God or religion who are also, there's also room in their minds to accept evolution, but maybe there's this feeling that somehow, you know, it's almost we're taught that you, you shouldn't teach it because it might, mm-hmm. or not to shouldn't teach it because that's not true, it's in the curriculum, but this like oh, it's somehow a threatening idea still, which there's an uncomfortable past 100 to it. years ago, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I really don't feel that they're, that it's, exclusive to have a faith in god or whatever and to accept scientific findings it's just um i mean personally for me there is a kind of a blindness towards of evolution mm. but i guess it really, you, know, you can still also, look at the evidence and the age and go that's how god did it i you know i guess it also really depends also yeah. on, on the particular religion and i i know that it's been interesting mm-hmm. to see how the current pope has been tackling some of these issues in terms of saying look you yeah. know concepts like evolution are not incompatible with our idea yeah. of god and and i and mm-hmm. i would hope that you know that the current pope can actually change that but of course that's very very different somewhere like america where the the brand of christianity that is you know oh, yeah, embraced yeah. there is very much more of the you know the the biblical the, the literalist biblical mm-hmm. <laughs> approach to things yeah. fundamentalist absolutely i was just going to say that um just uh, on the note of the of the book you recommended another one mm. um which i think is fantastic for kids is um called evolution how we and all living things came to be by daniel loxton um which is another fantastic mm-hmm. kids book which um explains the you know how evolution can be explained um and why such a simple theory is such a great explanation for for um how how we evolved yeah interesting Very good. Mm. i'm gonna look that up because yeah, well, I think the we'll one have... I've got is great for the like the sub five year old. Yeah, this one's obviously for, sli- <laughs> for slightly older kids, but yeah, really, really yeah, really yeah. Good. Well, that's good though. Like I like to have it, um, you know, an armory of books to turn to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's almost like the books that you use kind of evolve uh, and get more advanced <laughs> over time. It's a, oh dear! It's I am the intelligent designer, Edward. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe Daniel Loxton and Jonathan Tweet. And <laughs> well, we will of course have links to those books in the show notes and on the website, so that uh, more parents can educate their kids. Very good. But let's move on, and Joe. In the ongoing quest to find out what happens when you send creatures into space, a recent study has looked at the effects of microgravity on flatworms. And, well, weird things happen. (laughs) They don't necessarily know their heads from their tails, as it were, do they? No, they don't at all. And I have to confess, this is not the kind of story that I normally go for on on the show, but I I just, when I looked at this- There's no cancer in it at all. Oh, there's no cancer. There's no (laughs) prostates. There's no, oh, honestly. But I have to tell you, I looked at these little flatworms with their googly eyes and I just went, oh, I have to tell the story. Oh, good grief. And what's what's even better about these flatworms is they've got two sets of googly eyes. (laughs) So... So that's where the story is going. That's is, pretty much the story, isn't it? Much, that is pretty much the story. I'm just going to leave now. Um, so, oh. okay. So what they did was, you know, on the on the International Space Station, there's a, a whole range of scientific tests being done. There's re- really interesting research looking at the effects of being in space on on life in various different ways. But they were interesting. They were interested in looking at what happens to flatworms in space because they are often used to study tissue regeneration because they're able to regrow after they've been cut in half, including regrowing their heads. But what happened was they they sent some of these flatworms um, to the ISS 
ISS in uh, 2015. Some of them had been cut in half, some of them were whole, some of them had had their tails or their heads cut off. And what what happened was quite unexpected. The worms, um, rather than growing back a head and a tail, they grew back two heads, which was rather surprising. They don't know why this happens. Uh, they haven't really been able to, to understand exactly what the processes are that have led to this. Um, they they used uh, controls in the forms of, um, of flatworms that were on Earth in uh, sort of in a laboratory environment, um, and they they haven't been able to uh, see a similar sort of um, occurrence in the in the in the worms that were on Earth. But th- I, I guess the things that they're interested in are the different things that um, influence uh, um, cell regeneration in space, such as electric fields and magnetic fields and so on. And in particular, they're interested in, you know, in, in the implications of something like this for for human health, because of um, of, of how uh, what the implications are for wound care. You know, then one of the points that was made in in the article um, that I read about this was, you know, the fact that in the future we, you know, human beings will be will be likely to be travelling in space, and we need to actually understand how this uh, can impact on on human health in terms of uh, future space space travel. And I have to say, if you grow a second head in space i mean if you've got a spacesuit that's not going to fit that's well no be really awkward no no um and 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 we could have um you know uh, I'm, I'm seeing all kinds of b-grade uh you know horror movie type scenarios here but oh, but, I, but i have to say i really <laughs> i just i'm sorry but the, the 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 person who wrote the article about this story had to make the comparison to the human centipede and that oh that movie oh I'm sorry to anyone if you if you've never heard of human centipede don't go and look it up it's the most ghastly thing I've ever heard of in my life but as I was saying so yeah what what was really interesting is the thing about the the flatworm is that they're you know their heads and tails it's not it's not the way we think of a head and a, a tail in uh, in, a, in a vertebrate, in the sense of the, the, the top and bottom ends. The, the 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 flatworm's mouth is actually in the middle of its body, and um, it's attached to what they call the pharynx. Um, and this is the 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 section that regrows the head and the tail. Um, so in, in this case what happened with this flatworm was that it grew two heads but it also grew a second mouth um, and then the the worms that oh. were actually uninjured underwent what they call spontaneous fission which is um, a, a form of asexual reproduction where they split into two worms now fr- from what I can see I think that that's something that you know would happen um, you know not necessarily happen in space I think it would happen okay yeah in, in, in yeah. you know on earth as well um, but they, they think that may have been due to temperature fluctuations, not necessarily because of space itself. So, um, yeah, re- really, really interesting. Um, the, the, one of the things that, that they also found was that um, when the worm uh, was returned to Earth, it didn't go back to when, – when they cut off both of – hang on, let me just check this. So, when they cut off mm. both of its heads, it actually regrew them. So, it had permanently altered the flatworms bio- – well, not biology, but its body plan. Um, so, rather than then growing back a tail and a head, it grew back two heads again. Um, so they don't quite know why, and and I find that quite interesting because you know when we think um, of of um, anatomy in terms of the the body plan that that exists, you know when 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 we're grow, you know when a human being or when any other animal um, is growing uh, in whatever environment that they uh, that reproduction occurs, you know that 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 body plan that exists that tells the cells where to go and what you know and what and what to um, what to turn into is, is something that can be changed um, and that's very interesting how that can happen so it could be very interesting for future research we should also point out that uh, it was only the one worm that grew the two heads which had already had its head and tail sort of cut off when it before it was launched that is true. Space. so it could be just that one worm had the weird reactions and other ones might not do that so. it could be one complete yeah. anomaly exactly yeah 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 so it ne- needs to be replicated obviously we've we've talked about these flap worms before in terms of how you can yeah cut off their heads and they'll just grow another head but as as you point out it doesn't work the same way as it would in humans i am um, that the, the mouth is in the middle of it of its body and i don't know how much sort of nervous system makes up like a brain thing on flatworms or whether they're all just one spread out nervous system sort of like an octopus or something but our whole identity of when we think of heads and that being 
who people are mm-hmm. and, and, and well, where all the thought process happens. Mm-hmm. It doesn't obviously quite relate no, to flat No, 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 absolutely. And, and, but I think that's why it's interesting the way, you know, we look at it and we see these little eyes and we, and we, we, we almost an- we it's that, with that anthropomorphizing. Slightly. Absolutely. And, and slightly. Yeah. <laughs> Entirely. Uh, we never anthropomorphize very much on this program. <laughs> uh, just a little bit. It's tiny, tiny, tiny bit. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about the mass extinctions. And, Joe, you alluded to this earlier in the show. Throughout the history of life on our planet, there have been five mass extinctions. These are periods of time where a huge proportion of life was wiped out. Most famous, of course, was the dinosaur extinction 65 million years ago. There have been other volcanic events and atmospheric events that have had similar or even more drastic events. Recently, a lot of scientists have been suggesting that we're currently in the midst of a sixth mass extinction, and we humans are the prime cause of it. But at the annual general meeting of the Geological Society of America, paleontologist from the Smithsonian, Doug Irwin, argued against that notion And Penny, he somehow used American power outages like the 2003 blackouts in New York to explain it. And that's where I got lost. (laughs) Yeah, to be honest, I kind of was like, this power metaphor is not working for me. (laughs) So I went on to read the rest of what he was saying. And I think it's really interesting. It's not actually a very hopeful thing. Like when I clicked this, I'm like, we're not in a mass extinction. Great. Hooray. Yay. Um. We can keep on hunting everything. We can keep on doing what we're doing. (laughs) And one of the statistics just was shocking to me, not while I think about it, is that only 3% of the Earth's land animals are wildlife. 97% are humans, our livestock. I was quite shocked by that as well. Mm. Like now I think about it, I'm not shocked, but it is kind of shocking to think of. and. What's really interesting is this, these mass extinctions that we talk about in the past, it's easy to look at what's happening now and go, my gosh, you know, there used to be a million tight lions, you know, in 0 AD or 1 AD and now there's 20,000. Look at what's going on with our bees. Look at butterflies and moths. So it's not just our charismatic megafauna but a whole bunch of things. Look at coral reefs and sharks. Yeah, I was say and fish. And, yeah. Fish and Everything, but all of these animals are really quite big. And Irwin's take is more that when you look at these animals, they may or may not be in the fossil record. Um, passenger pigeon, passenger pigeons are one big one, hmm. and there's no fossils of them. If we were looking at the fossil record, we would have no idea. Oh, there's two fossils of them or something. We would have no idea that this was a really abundant species that had kind of disappeared. So we can't look at these kinds of organisms and say this is a mass extinction. So the argument is not that what is going on is not bad. It is. But that are we right in calling it a mass extinction? And the kinds of organisms that are present and abundant in the fossil record are weird little, you know, tiny, so not weird, but, you know, tiny little hard-bodied, really widespread planktonic kind of things, things like foraminifera. And none of them are really going extinct right now at the moment so we don't have many great fossils of i don't know elephants or whatever but we do have so 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 many fossils of um you know little marine creatures that are not important to us in any way not for fishing not even obviously for food for the fish that we eat and so on and that, that word you used for raminifera? for raminifera yeah i only just i brought them because when i did geology they're so abundant. They're these little um, hard, hard-bodied sort of plankton creatures. They're like sand. Yeah. Essentially, when they die, they're like sand, and you can get whole layers of them. They're so abundant, and yet most people, you know, they're not really on the radar. And it's that kind of thing that goes extinct in a mass extinction. So mm-hmm. we could be helpful and go, "Oh, that's great." You know, it's really sad that we might not have pandas anymore, but you know. The world's going to survive. There's still rats. There's still cockroaches. Or we could go, well, no, no, no. But, I mean, in all seriousness, yeah. life will go on. And look, as it yep. has in all the previous ones, or we go, okay, how close are we to losing these really base organisms of food webs, which we truly don't fully understand? 
And at any point, and I think this is where the power metaphor comes in, there could be a tipping point where a little problem just snowballs and snowballs into something that cannot be contained. So something Irwin said that I found quite, again, quite shocking was if we are in the middle of a mass extinction or if it's already started, we may as well forget about conservation biology. There's no point. Like things are now bigger than us. But if we're not, then we still have a hope. So, I mean, I And how do you know if you're at that How do you know? And you yeah. don't know. So, I think you have to always act as if you're not at that tipping point. Yeah. And that our actions can make a difference. And, you know, I personally, like, I want to live in a world with the Great Barrier Reef and whales and elephants. Yeah. Even if they are only 3%. I don't care, I don't, you know. I don't care I want so much to be about there. the pandas. But, yeah, everything else yeah, I'm, I'm cool there. with. Mm. <laughs> Emus. Yeah. Emus, yeah. I, th- I think... The basic takeaway from this is there can be no question that we are having yeah. a huge oh. dramatic effect on the environment that we live in and that this planet is now has mm. seen things just in the last hundred or so years that it had never seen before in terms of yeah. climate change, in terms of hunting and that sort of gradual extinction as opposed to mm. some big, you know, an asteroid type sudden thing. Mm. But it's it's not good and we really need to reassess our approach to so many things of course and finally joe a rather odd story about human fetuses and how they can apparently how they apparently prefer to look at faces even though they're in the womb Mm. walk us through (laughs) this one Uh, yeah i had to walk I I'm sitting to walk comfortably through this one, I have to say. Um, you know, I think the research here is really interesting. I think it uh, it's important and I think it, it, it could lead somewhere. I'm just not convinced that the conclusions they've drawn necessarily um, are borne out by, by what they what they did. So, you know, there's been a huge amount of research that's been done looking at at kids and and babies, particularly in terms of um, you know develop their development and um, how they respond to uh, various stimuli uh, from things like uh, you know how babies respond to uh, sound and um, just developing senses like falling. Um, uh, you know, sorry, let me um, start that again. Um, you know, even even things like preference for certain objects and so. On. On. Um, but the 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 way that um, the research has been going is to look um, more at the at what goes on in utero um, and looking at what fe- the, the fetus can sense as it develops. Um, and there's been research that's been done up until now looking at how uh, fetuses respond to sound, um, and I think possibly to other stimuli. But what these researchers wanted to look at was how they respond to light and visual stimuli. And I have to say, I, I actually was not aware that uh, of, of the point during um, fetal development when the, the, their eyes actually do start to open. Uh, and it, it was actually a lot earlier than I realised. Um, I'm just trying to – let me just double-check when it is. So, um, at around 20 to 24 weeks uh, into development, um, the fetus is actually upright in the womb and its eyelids unfuse. Um, and it can then see, but um, but what it can see yeah. is very much um, distorted um, or, or blocked by the, the, the way the light travels through the mother's body into the uterus. Um, and what these researchers wanted to do was actually see if they could test um, how the fetus responded to different uh, different light stimuli, uh, and they used uh, three points of light, which they shone um, through the the um, the mother's um, abdomen. They they this was it was far less crude than it sounds. They they did a lot of um, they did a lot to actually work out you know how light would travel through tissue and and to you know actually calculate um, what it would, you know what would be needed for them to actually be able to visualize this um, this light, and they used three points of light. Um, and the and the three points of light, so so it would have looked like the therefore symbol or the uh, the because symbol, so a dot and two dots down the mm-hmm. bottom, um, and they they projected it through the the into the uterus either upright or the other way round. Uh, and when I say upright, the upright version would have been the equivalent to a, a face, so eyes at the top, um, and you know a mouth or nose, whatever at the bottom, which, which is what. Uh, okay, an upside down triangle. 
Exactly. And what they found was that when they did this, the fetus would turn towards the light, but they were much more likely to do so when the three points of light were turned with the, uh, where, where it was top heavy. In other words, where the eyes are at the, the, the two points of light were at the top and the single point of light was at the bottom. Now, what they have suggested from this is that this suggests an uh, an innate preference for uh, for faces um, because of the fact that this shape is representative of the human face. In other words, the top heavy eyes at the top, mouth down the bottom. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, that's where I felt this kind of really lost me was that, you know, I, I think that certainly, um, you know, yes, we, we can certainly say that, that, that this, this pattern is, re- is representative of the design of the human face, but I think it's incredibly um, mm. really taking a bit of a leap to say that that therefore suggests a face preference. All we know is that a particular light balance created a greater response. That's, that's, I think, all that they could really derive from that. That's all that you can concretely say from mm, this mm. study. But, I mean, we do know that the human brain is ex- very strongly wired to recognise faces. Absolutely. That's why we see the face on Mars. That's why we see faces in clouds mm-hmm. and Jesus on toast and stuff, that pareidolia. So, uh, it, I don't think it's that much of a huge leap to then say that they're – that as – infants or, or fetuses, we would be wired to look to that? Oh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's a leap to say that, that, you know, you could suggest that. I think that it makes sense in terms of what we know about um, the way humans respond to faces, about, uh, about pattern recognition and so on. I think that's a completely reasonable thing to assume, but I think that you can't con- make the conclusion. It's not a, it's not a, conc- it, it's, it's suggestive. That's all. Yeah. I, I'm also curious as to just how well a fetus can see anyway, because isn't it like newborn babies can't focus well, that, and exact, see precise things at exactly a distance right. or something it, like that? Like what, what sort of development is going on? Oh, I don't know how well we know that. No, well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it'd be interesting to see if they could um, somehow actually – show what stage of development the visual cortex is at, the actual development of the pupils and the retina and the, the, the whole eye structure to, to know, mm. you know, what what would they actually be able yeah. to see here? Would they be able to see these three distinct points of light? Would they be able to just see this fuzzy sort of, you know, shape which was slightly, you know, bulkier at the top and narrower down the bottom? Um, mm. And, and yeah, I, I suppose just see see what they can find from that. Uh, you know, they are they are suggesting other other research they could, that they could do using this type of technique. They're, they they think it would be quite re- interesting to look at things like um, detecting cataracts and other visual problems um, in utero, which which I think is yeah. another interesting uh, idea. Interesting Absolutely, thought. I'm actually actually finding my interest really um, sparked by this because I'm now sort of wondering, you know, at what le- at what point in time in the development does the blink reflex start like you know are we sort of blinding them by shining these bright well absolutely and, and thing? can they turn away and easily? that was and actually that sort of one stuff. of the things that they uh, the researchers said was that they uh, they would actually just strongly say that you know people should not be going and shining lights into uteruses because we don't know the effect that it can be having we don't know whether it could be too bright yeah. and could actually cause distress or cause harm um, so, you know, certainly it's something that, that should be done, you know, I guess under, under research conditions where they know what they're actually doing and the level of light that they're using and, and so on. But, you know, as, as I said, I just, look, I, th- I think that it's a, it's a really interesting study. I just was a little bit, um, apprehensive about, you know, the, the, the place that it went to. Although I have to say, um, Ed Yong was the was the uh, the author of the um, the article on this, and and uh, he he is one of my favourite science journalists. So he certainly didn't take it too far. No, he always does a good job. Although sometimes I find his articles a little harder to understand than others. But you know, mm. everyone's a bit mm. hit and miss to some degree. But. Now, it's a good article. It's a really interesting study and, and question. So, I'm, I'm really mm, glad that we definitely. talked about it. 
one one other thing that this made me think of is um you know I do wonder or I find it I find it quite interesting with these kinds of studies um you know as we learn more about this uh, in terms of the ethical issues that some of these studies could end up taking us to in terms of you know issues like abortion and so on um, I think it'd be very interesting to sort of see as we learn more and more about fetal development and and what goes on I could see some of the findings from some of this research used to push various ideologies as well so that that's mm. another aspect of it I think um, is, is um, worth considering yeah oh but by 24 weeks they can recognize human <laughs> faces we can't yeah. yeah that's yeah mm. good point and even just more restrictions on what pregnant women are advised to do or not do like oh you can't go outside because the yeah, yeah. you know like and I, I know that sounds mm-hmm. ridiculous. No, no, no. I, I, I know what you mean. I think, I think, um, you know, you start getting these recommendations that can be very controlling of women's behaviour as well, and um, it, it's, mm. it's, it is worrying. Yeah, uh, I think we're done. All the links to the stories we talked about today are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash two six eight. Let us know what you think. Leave us a comment. Get in touch with us on social media, and please leave us a review on iTunes. And if you like the show, you want to help us make more, go to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledge on Patreon. Really appreciate all those who have contributed some money our way. Thank you for joining me, Penny and Joe. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. This episode was edited with a large slice of red velvet cake by (laughs) Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. And I know that that explanation will still not satisfy some. There are going to be some truly toxic comments below this video, (laughs) alongside the usual ones about how I look like an owl who can't get a date for prom. (laughs) Or or that I probably live alone, surrounded by jars I'm too weak to open by myself. (laughs) And and the thing... You're laughing too hard at that. And those comments will link to the hidden truths about vaccines and demand to know why I didn't look into them. And you know what? We did look into a lot of them. And the problem is, I can go point by point by point and be talking for hours tonight, and this will still never end. It's like whack-a-mole. As one theory goes down, another pops up. And I kind of get the insistence that there must be a link. The age children are supposed to get the MMR vaccine happens to be the same age that diagnosable signs of autism can begin to appear. But Correlation is not causation. That is what scientific studies are for. And remember, they are really clear that link is not there. And the problem with spending more and more time and money trying to prove that link is that it takes resources away from studying actual causes and treatments.